the energy business isn't big business. It is enormous business. And that leads me directly to the thesis of my book, which is energy independence is hogwash. We have a stronger word here in Texas than hogwash, but hogwash. The idea that the United States, the world's single biggest energy consumer, can be or should be independent of the world's single biggest industry, the $5 trillion a year energy business, is ludicrous on its face. And yet, in the current presidential campaign, we hear John, uh, John McCain, Barack Obama, uh, Nancy Pelosi on the left, uh, the, the neoconservatives on the right, all saying, we need energy independence. Hogwash. Hogwash. It is not going to happen. It is not desirable. And I would argue it's probably not even doable. The fact is, we live in a global economy that is becoming more global every day. And if you don't believe that, you haven't been reading the headlines. Look at the financial meltdown that's ongoing today. Bank failures in Iceland are affecting uh, investors, common investors throughout Europe. The American banking crisis has, has affected the whole world. Yesterday, the uh, Kuwaitis bailed out one of their banks. Why? Because they're shorting the dollar. Well, what we're seeing in the global financial sector is the, is the epitome of globalization. And I think that that trend is clearly going to accelerate. But of course, it's not just about finance, from iPods to cell phones, beer, bottled water, tennis rackets, tennis shoes, uh, fresh flowers, diesel fuel, you name it. We are living in an ever more global economy, and that globalization is accelerating, not decelerating. I wrote this book because I was really disgusted with the political rhetoric. I've written a couple of other books, but this one I wrote because I, I got to a point where I said, if, if our politicians cannot speak to us honestly and forthrightly about the single most important commodity in the global economy, what can we have an honest discussion about? So it is that one problem is it is degrading our political rhetoric. Another problem that I think is a serious one is that it, this energy independence rhetoric is being used to promote some of the biggest boondoggles of the modern era, and in that, I'm talking specifically about uh, uh, the corn ethanol scam and biofuels, but I'll come back to that. My second point. So why does this concept of energy independence have so much appeal today? I think there are four factors, and these four factors contribute to what I think is a free-floating anxiety in American politics today and in the American electorate. Now, tangential point, or maybe it's just it's on point here, but clearly the financial crisis is, is, has a lot of people worried. I'm one of them. I've seen my 401k melt down to a, as Christopher Buckley said, it's just a 1k. Um, so that's clearly part of the anxiety people are feeling. But on the energy front, I think that there are four factors: the second Iraq war, global warming, peak oil, and terrorism. Those four factors, I think, are combining uh, it, to give people, to, to worry the public. And they're, they're, they're told about energy independence, and they, ah, well, that sounds good. The pollsters have, have latched onto this, and they understand it very well. In my book, I uh, cite a, a memo from October of 2006 by the Democratic strategist James Carville. It's right before the Im important midterm elections. Carville sends out a memo that says, quote, Research shows that a candidate that says he or she will go to Washington and change things there and will work together with both parties to do major things to move the country toward energy independence has a powerful impact on the vote. It is the one issue that gives people hope. That's it. It is the one issue that gives people hope. If you're a politician and you have a two-word phrase that gives people hope, you are going to use it. Now, if I were going to be cute and wanted a two-word phrase that gives people hope, I'd say free beer. <laughs> I'm not running for office. The point is that the Republicans and Democrats have adopted this line because it appeals to the voting public. And I think that the most important point of those four points that I made is terrorism. It is clearly the key theme in all of this. It is the line that we hear from Boone Pickens, we hear it from Barack Obama, we hear it from Bill Clinton. We're sending $700 billion, now it's about half that number today, we're sending $700 billion overseas to people who don't like us. And the gist of the argument is if only we bought less oil, terrorism would decline. The petrostates would, would be bankrupted, they would have to open their societies, uh, they would reform, become uh, uh, Jeffersonian democracies, and all would be well. 
The fact is, this argument does not hold up. And I'll tell you why in just a second. Before I do, look, I'll gladly stipulate that some of these petrostates have links to terrorism. That is not a secret. I will gladly stipulate that. Fifteen of the 19 hijackers on September 11th were Saudis. The Saudis and their Islamic charities, many of them have been linked to some of the radical madrasas teaching radical strains of Islamic fundamentalism. That's obvious. Libya, before the recent uh, thawing of relations, was considered by the State Department a state sponsor of terrorism. They were clearly behind the Lockerbie uh, uh, bombing, the Pan Am 103 plane. Now the relations have thawed. They're no longer considered a state sponsor of terrorism, but they are a petrostate that has links to terror in the past. The obvious one is Iran, Hezbollah and Hamas. They've been funding Hezbollah and Hamas for years. I think it's fair to say Hezbollah and Hamas have not been sources of peace and stability in the Middle East. I gladly stipulate all of that. The problem is we cannot isolate the petrostates from the global oil market. We cannot. I, I will challenge you to, to name a single marketplace anywhere in the world that is as transparent and where price discovery is as easy as the global market today in crude oil and oil products. You can go to any terminal, in any computer terminal in the world, find out the price of diesel fuel in Tokyo, Rotterdam, New York, uh, crude oil in Cushing, crude oil in uh, uh, North Sea Brent, crude oil from uh, the Persian Gulf. Price discovery, th this is an amazingly transparent market. And I would argue in the history of, of humankind, there has never been one that is more open and more transparent. We cannot isolate the petrostates from the global economy. It will not happen. We could quit buying oil tomorrow. It will not stop terrorism. The thesis that lower prices will lower or will decrease terrorism has been tested, and it has been proven false. Between 1986 and about 2000, 2001, the price of oil generally stayed below $20 per barrel. In late 1998, you may recall, it fell as low as $11 per barrel. Now, it could fall as low as $40, $50 from the price it is now. Who knows? The point is we had a 15-year period, 16-year period, in which prices stayed generally below $20. We had terrorism when oil was at $20. We will have terrorism when oil is at $200 or $300 or more. On September 11th, the day of the Al-Qaeda attacks, the price of oil was $27.65. Where is the link between high oil prices and terrorism? 